There's a Yupik word for that that's, you know, 10,000 years old, and it's called the way in which we are always getting ready. We're getting ready for the seasons. We're, uh, there might be a change in your caribou herd or the salmon run isn't running right. Something is going on that's threatening your security or your survival. And you must be thinking forward to how, how do we adjust for that? You know, what moves are we going to make? And how are we going to mobilize as a community behind this? Um, and so for me, just transition, we have a word for it. Um, and it, from our perspective, it means how do we mobilize our community, which has become so dependent on fossil fuels. Uh, we pay about seven seventy nine dollars a gallon of heating fuel. And if you run a business, you're, you're paying a dollar a kilowatt hour for electricity. And our state of Alaska is 90% operating budget is based off of the price of fuel which plummeted. So if the state couldn't afford these power cost equalization programs, my people wouldn't be able to keep our lights on. And so we knew far ahead of time that we ourselves need to transition away from, from this as a source of energy. And um, for us, from an indigenous perspective, it means coming together as a community and asking everyone what is the best, self-determining our own path forward, and then finding allies along the way, but, but it being our plan. The Just Transition movement was really sort of based on this premise of transitioning workers, making sure that folks, if you know there was a transition from one energy um, sort of power play of like let's say coal or gas or oil, and we were moving to more renewables like wind and solar, that those people would be able to transition and that they would be able to transition easily and they wouldn't have a burden economically. But tran just transition is morphing into much more than just about jobs. It's about access, access to decision making, access to sovereignty and control and determination of how energy projects are built or how those, um, the plans are even laid out for how communities can build communities that are sustainable beyond just energy. It's more than just about these ideas around changing from one energy source to another, but rather about how do we create just communities that have access to clean, healthy air, water, and land. And ultimately for our communities, it's really about how we can have uh, fair access to and, and recognition of our lands and territories as our lands and territories that are critical to our cultural survival. Coming from the tar sands, I think a lot of what our communities have seen is impacts um, in terms of um, environmental degradation, impacts in terms of being the first to experience also climate change being that north. And I think one of the things for me when I when realizing, you know, I think just transition here in the US originally started out as transitioning workers and so transitioning our workers, which yeah, in the tar sands they also need to be transitioned. But I think when I started um, fundraising for my first solar project, I realized actually if I'm not actually the one that's implementing solar in my community, it's actually not gonna happen. We have 1,200 small to medium scale indigenous led projects across Canada, and we have 150 large scale in renewable energy projects across Canada. So that's what a just transition means to me is that it's led by indigenous communities for our communities implementing in our communities being active participants and not yet again passive participants in what we call energy or energy democracy or energy literacy that we're actually determining our future what our future looks like and for me being from the tar sands just transition means actually us determining that we want renewable energy and solar in the sunniest province of canada as opposed to yet again more resource extraction for North American indigenous folks, you know, our culture, our values, our knowledge was demonized for centuries. And it was devalued by white society. And you know, systems of white supremacy and colonialism and capitalism really worked to try and make us feel as though our knowledge systems were not valuable. And so part of just transition is not just transitioning fuel sources and all and jobs, but it's about how do we transition our our mind frames, our frameworks, and how we approach these things to include the diversity of indigenous knowledge and indigenous communities into the development of solutions. When you create top-down, I know, patriarchal, colonialistic approaches to protection and preservation of ecosystems or solutions for communities, they don't work. 
But when a com company came in and was like, we're going to work with you and we're going to work with your knowledge and your community, suddenly you now have a successful project. For me, when I go into another person's territory, if I go into another indigenous person's territory, I do not tell them what to do. I do not, I say wh whatever way that they do, the way that they do it is how I will do it here. And I think that's something that colonialism has really wiped out in the sense of respecting the people and the place um, and what the governance laws and structures are there for good reason. The reason why you see indigenous peoples fight to the death um, to protect the land is because land is our relation. Land is a part of, is who we are. Um, it's inseparable from um, indigenous peoples and our culture and our languages. And, um, and I start to see that more and more with non-indigenous peoples. So first of all, the transition needs to come from our own communities because for us it isn't just a transition from one sector. For a lot of our indigenous communities, everything is holistic or we don't have a healthy well community. If our ultimate goal is to survive and sustain ourselves as a healthy community, there are a lot of components. Um, we need, you know, our education system needs to be decolonized. We have energy security, food security, economic security. We have to take a holistic approach. So first of all, for, for the work that I do, we aren't just focusing on energy. It, it, there are a lot of facets that we need. Um, our community had to take a hard look at this because if our young people kept moving out of our village, we would, we would no longer exist. In Alaska, you need to have 10 students enrolled or your school closes and then your village pretty much dies. So our governance sat down with the youth and they said, what do we need to do to make this a place that you want to return to? And so we went from that and, and it turned into, we need affordable energy, we need to provide jobs. And we started from that. And then from our own plan, our own self-determination plan, which is now 20 years in the making, uh, that they've been looking critically at our survival, they said, Who, what kind of partners do we need to bring this forward? And we have, um, tri by trial and error, learned what, what kind of partnerships, especially in energy development, will work. You can come in and think you have all the answers because you're the greatest engineers on the planet, or you can come in and recognize that you're dealing with a people who have lived here for thousands of years and understand their resources and, and design around with their, and acknowledge that uh, it's a collaborative effort. We're not just talking about protecting individual communities. We're talking about protecting massive amounts of biodiversity that is critical for the entire planet. Um, and I really think that that needs to be key that when we talk about just transition strategies that empower and uplift communities to be the, the ones determining these projects, it's not just about reducing emissions. It's not just about just transition economies or energy sources. It's about protection of the, of the sacred. We've always been a visionary people and we need to believe that we still have it inherently that we can envision the solutions. <laughs>